thank you for coming out yes. tonight. Woo! Woo! Yeah. yeah. Sunday mor morning, righteous indignation, Bobernacle <laughs> Choir, and uh, Massacre, whatever. Here we go. Yeah, you can't hear his. I don't know if you hear it out there. Can't hear it here.
right. Good. Oh, and I hear the voice better, too. It, it always sounds better when we're not playing. Test, test, test. <laughs> yeah, I know. Uh, all right, so this song is called Lake Song. So we'll dedicate it to Bob, since that's been his yeah. whole life pretty much, is these Our. lakes up here. Long, like you, you have long, kind of blonde hair. He needs a little bit more guitar in the monitor. He can't quite hear.
Blame it on Mike. Mike.
Mark, Jim, yeah. cheer. Yes, sir. Yeah. 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 I actually think that I'm playing with someone. Like, he was throwing the way off. <laughs> Run it down? Yeah. Another Mark Angier song. I love this song. I love all his songs, but I love this one especially. But it doesn't have a lot to say. 
would hold me seemed to only hold me down. Other times it seemed to make me strong. And of all the feelings, good and bad, I get from this old town. The feeling I miss most is I belong. But it doesn't have a lot to say. It's just me in this dirty old town I was born in. I get a little older every day. It's just me in this dirty old town I was born in. I get a little older every day. Thank you, Mark. All right, thanks, Sam. Do you want to do? Uh, I don't know. Look. You do, you can look. Look. That's why I brought it. Oh, yeah, you expect me to read that? No, I do it through interpretive dance. I don't Sam, know. Sam, pick a song. Yeah, let's, we haven't done Dust on the Country Road. Oh, let's do that. Okay, let's keep that in. That That's in A. We capo on the, on the yeah. second fret. got to sleep, it was on my wedding night. I was tangled in the sheets, I was dreaming of a light. Pouring from her window, coming up through the floor. Pushing back the darkness, crashing through my kitchen door. Down to that old oak table, I went to take a look. And my whole life flashed before me Just like a storybook She used to make me breakfast Or sit around and talk Have another cup of coffee Maybe take a little walk Dust down a country road Blowing truck is going somewhere I just can't be sure and tomorrow's just a day after all it's gone before I always thought of leaving never could stay too long now her memory is catching up and her sweet dreams are all gone like dust down a country road Blowing in the wind behind an old truck load Up before the rooster crows There's an old dog staring at the dust down the country road Come on, Lord. Yeah, Ted. And I'd catch 
catch that old dog napping And I shoot him before he runs Cause he ain't much good for nothing Except staring at the coast I wonder what he's looking at Staring back at us Like dust and a country road Blowing in the wind Behind an old truckload Up before the rooster crows There's an old dog staring at the dust Dust down a country road Blowing in the wind behind an old truck Up before the rooster crows There's an old dog staring at the dust in the country road Yeah, there's an old dog staring at the dust in the country road Thank you. Uh, we, well, we do one more, I, I guess. We could do uh, there's people in your healing, Amy. Uh, there's Carmelina. Oh, oh, Carmelina. That's just that. I'll just play. Uh, All right. I'm going to step out because I don't want to hear from you. What a You're the one who convinced me to do it in E to begin with, because you like it there. All right, this is a Warren Zevon song. And I'm all strong. 
right upon my Smith Corona. Ted, Mark, yep. Scott, Lauren, and Carrie, thank you. And Sam. Who's up next? All right. All right. Thank you guys very much. This is the uh, Bobernackle, what do we call it? The Bobernackle Righteous Indignation Band. They'll be here on May 10th for Sunday Music Series, 20th, May 20th with Bob Brower hopefully joining us. And welcome back, Bob. We are so happy to see you. This has been a wonderful treat for all of us. Lance Walter knew you were coming, so he didn't prepare anything. And I think that's just Lance. Uh, you know, he's a little older. Um, Jess, uh, by the way, Jill, that Jess said you could go home with the baby. Just give her back by Thursday. Um, and uh, it's good mojo, right, Tom? Tom needs a break. Um, Jess needs a break. So we're going to just bring Lance right up with maybe a single microphone. We don't even need to take everything down because I know, uh, I know Bob's got to go. He may want to hear a couple of lines of Lance. Um, all right, Lance, come on up here. Get her head started. He's wearing his good Hawaiian shirt. We're very excited. He's got three of them. He's got his uh, orthopedic open mic shoes. And you know the deal. Once he can't get up the stairs, he's done. We don't let him up anymore. Lance, this is how many times have you been? 410. Lance has done this 410 times. He started in our open mic back in 2006, and he has come almost every week, despite the fact we've changed the time, we've locked the doors, he keeps coming. And uh, 410 times. I mean, I can't think of anything I've done 400, well, one or two things, but 400. <laughs> 410 times. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Mr. Lance Walter. Uh, this is a few pluses of being Adam and Eve. These are a few pluses, all right? Neither has to worry about tan lines. Tan lines, having tan lines. Eve won't have to ask Adam if the fig leaf makes her look fat. Neither can be arrested for streaking. Now these are the pluses, right? These are the pluses. Adam will never have to hear Eve say she should have married so-and-so. At the present time, she is the most beautiful woman in the world. The world is their toilet. Eve can always say, how they hang him. No surprise visit by in-laws. Remember, these are all pluses, right? Hopefully, I've got some more here. Can drink all the coconut and milk they want and won't get pulled over. On the snakes trivia night, they both ace the Bible questions. And they will not have to worry about a President Kardashian. <laughs> I hear some, uh, there are some more of these. These are ice creams that didn't quite make the, the cut. All right, now they didn't make it, all right? Regurgitating raspberry didn't make the cut. 
Sphincter Chocolate Crunch. Didn't make it. Cream of Cornhole. <laughs> Crushed Cadaver Coconut. Tapeworm Taffy Twist. Now, that wasn't too bad. Oh, I got a, some of these I can't say. Severe Mind Grain Mango. <laughs> Malaria Induced Maple Walnut. Didn't make it. Iron Crotch Cinnamon. <laughs> Didn't make it. I, I, like I say, I got to be careful here. I don't know if I got any more than that. Let's see. No, not tonight. I had another one here, but I... <laughs> uh, I, what am I, I don't know what I did with it. Lance, uh, is this part of your act right nah, here? The working? I had another one. I, I had uh, I had bad, uh, bad uh, band names, but I don't know what I did with it. Oh. You dropped oh, it. Oh, did I? Oh, okay. There you go. Thank goodness, I think. These are bad band names. If you organize a group, you shouldn't use these. Talent unaware. Neuter gentleman. Two man quartet. Amish impersonators. Part time surgeon. Guys named Hitler. <laughs> it's, it's another good band. <laughs> Clowns without makeup. Nameless nut jobs. Mimes with laryngitis. And this one I don't think too many people will get, right? Common Kazi survivors. Anybody get that? Okay. And the last one is Super Punching Seniors. Not a good band name. <laughs> I just got a few more. These are old observations, all right? Uh, for example, if pigs could fly, they'd have a lot more stuff to clean up, right? <laughs> Zebras are just horses that have been in jail. <laughs> the Liberty Bell isn't all that's cracked up to be. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> Wouldn't you think chickens would hate that buffalo bar over owner? There should be a hair transplant for bald eagles. How can you tell if an elephant is overweight? Would you recognize Harry Potter if he wore contacts? A laundromat clothes dryer is no substitute for a sauna. And finally, I was a 300 pound jockey in a past life. Thank you. Lance Walter. Oh, hello. Mm. Um, the dog goes whoop, the cat goes meow, the bird goes tweet, and the mouse goes squeak. The frog goes croak, the fish goes blub, and the elephant goes to there's the duck say quack, and something goes blow, then the seal goes ow, 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 but there's one sound we never know. What does the fox say? What does the fox say? A 
of the hills and leave your standing still. The fur is red, so beautiful, like an angel in the skies. But if you meet a friendly horse, will you communicate by more? What does the fox say by Elvis? And it was a little bit experimental. Thank you so much. Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> thank you. Uh, let's see. Um, so, let's see. My, my next song is a uh, song by Chris Stapleton. It's... Um, called Broken Halos, and, uh, and once upon a time, Dusty Pascal told me I should have a, um, a bridge, so I added a bridge to it, which isn't there, so, um, which is somebody else's song, but yeah. See my share of broken halos, folded wings they used to fly. All gone wherever they go. Broken halos they used to shine. Angels come down from above, helping us on our way. Then they, then they leave us. Find some other soul to save. Um, oh, make me an angel. Fly away from Montgomery. That, da, 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 da. I knew the words before I came here. Make me an angel. Something to hold on to. Thank you. Whiskey to water, sugar in your tea. 
See all this crazy question you're asking me This is the craziest party that could ever be Don't turn on the lights, James, because I don't want to see Because Mama told me not to come She told me not to come Mom, she said That ain't the way to have fun, no son That ain't the way to have fun Open up the windows, that's a Meritus room I think I'm choking on the smell of stale perfume And that vape you're smoking nearly scared me half to death Open up the window, fellas, let me catch my breath Cause mama told me not to come No, she told me not to come Mom, she said that ain't the way to have fun Son, that ain't the way to have fun No Rachel's blasting, someone's knocking at the door. I look at my lady bird, she's passed on the floor. I see so many crazy things I ain't never seen before. Don't know what it is, but I don't want to see no more. Cause mama told me not to come. No, she told me. Next up, we got our resident Vietnam vet, David Tarleton, going to come up here and share some stories with us. Come on up. Do you want the handheld or do you want to want this mic? What? is uh, Dave Tarleton. Uh, I've been up here the last couple weeks and i uh, telling you about uh, me getting drafted and being sent, being sent to Vietnam. And, uh, and last week I talked about arriving at the uh, this place called Dao Tiang, which was uh, 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 affectionately known as Rocket City too. This is the home of A Battery, the 1st and 27th Artillery, which was where the battery I was assigned. This battery was a battery of six 155 self-propelled howitzers. Uh, my first day there, I finally got to check out the uh, gun and the gun crew. The gun was an M109 155 self-propelled howitzer. It looked like a tank, though it wasn't a tank. The only artillery piece that you fired from the inside, and it was very hot inside this gun, basically because they made us wear fatigue shirts and steel pots. They had a 10, ten man gun crew uh, divided into a 12 hours, uh, a night crew and a day crew, which were divided in 12 hour shifts. And there were uh, five guys on each crew. There was uh, two outside men, a gunner, assistant gunner, and the gun chief. Uh, plus the ammo carrier. <laughs> we very rarely had a 10-man crew. People were out sick or they were out on R&R uh, &R or some reason so. Oh. 
These are some of the guys I served a year in Vietnam. Uh, guy's name was David Russell. He was from Texas, real nice guy, redhead. Mike was from Honolulu, and he was a National Guard unit. A lot of people joined the National Guard during the Vietnam War to uh, get out of being drafted. But uh, President Johnson decided in the end of 1968 to, to activate several National Guard units, so he got activated and sent to Vietnam. Our guy was named was Unger from Hawaii, uh, Chicago. He was drafted. Uh, so, uh, Dick St. Ange, who was a, another National Guard who got drafted, he was from New Hampshire. And we had Barney from Chicago, Sherman from Baltimore, Jerry from Chicago. We liked, liked Jerry because his wife used to send him uh, nude photos of, him, of herself and uh, Used to show them to us naturally, so. And we had Bobby McNamara from New Jersey, who was perpetually stoned all the time. Then we had Acid Man from San Francisco. He kept saying, uh, you gotta hear this new band, you gotta hear this new band, Santana. And they hadn't even got popular at Woodstock yet, so. Then we had this guy, Pancho from Guam, and uh, he, uh, apparently he beat up the, the local police chief for screwing around with his girlfriend, so uh, he had a choice between joining the army or going to jail, so he picked the army. So Then we had this other guy, a uh, friend of mine called Hines. We called him Mr. Worm because he insulted everybody, so he reminded us of Don Rickles, naturally. So Then we had another guy called, this was, this was his real name. He was a surfer from Hernando Beach, California. He was called Lance was his name. <laughs> first day these guys uh, told me stories about what had been happening just before I got there. You know, I don't know if they wanted to keep me up, uh, let me know what was going on, or are they just trying to scare the shit out of me. But anyway, so uh, they had a ground attack. I arrived at the end of April. They had a ground attack in February. In March, the gun six, the gun I was on, had been mortared, and the gun was completely blown up. A couple guys were wounded. In fact, uh, Unger... He got there in March, and he said when he got there, the uh, guns, the old gun six blown up was on a flatbed. And one of his first jobs he had to do was he had to clean up the uh, ammo pit, actually the uh, ammo dump, I should say, where we stored our ammo, because uh, every time we got a supply of ammunition, the NBA would blow it up. So. And uh, worst, worst part was... Uh, just happened a couple weeks before I got there. Gun 5, which was our sister gun, uh, uh, it had been rocketed, and unfortunately the uh, rockets hit the gun. The gun power caught on fire, and three guys inside were killed. Basically, they were burned alive. I mean, their lungs were scorched, and uh, so it wasn't a very good scene there anyway. So. Uh, so. so I heard all this, and I decided, well, I kind of had skated my way through... Uh, basic training, skated my way through AIT, and I said, I better get my shit together all of a sudden, you know, because I mean, this was serious. I could, I could have been killed. I could have gotten, I could get some of the guys on the gun crew killed. So I, I had to get my shit together, and I actually did, believe it or not. So. Author Larry, he Author Larry Heineman, he was with the 25th Division in Vietnam, and he wrote one of the best novels about the war. It was called Close Quarters. And uh, he referred to the Vietnam War as a war of the death's, death's breath nightmare kind. Sometimes we call it the Magical Mystery Tour. The Magical Mystery Tour is coming to take you away, dying to take you away. Luckily, things started calming down by the time I arrived. So, uh, Mike, who's become my best friend, told me when I heard the word incoming to get in the bunker quickly. And he taught me the difference between a sound of a rocket and the sound of a mortar. He said, the first time I uh, heard the word incoming, make sure to go downstairs in the bunker right away. So, uh, I started on the day shift as an outside man. Ammo carrier. One of the first times I was on the 
I was carrying ammo and I was on the right side of the gun in the parapet. And uh, the gun chief yelled, stand by. It was what, when you fired the gun, you yelled, stand by then. And uh, uh, of course, I didn't realize that's what it meant, fire the gun. So I got blown halfway across the parapet. The glasses were flying. I didn't get hurt, luckily. So another time we hit, one of the first times I heard incoming, I was too slow going down the stairs and I got trampled. I remember one of the first times I would work nights as an outside man. Uh, we had a lot, a lot of mortars coming in, and uh, I remember sitting there praying, actually. So, uh, But I got used to it. Uh, after a while, though, used to, you know, rocket some mortars. I remember uh, one time, one of the batteries next to us, uh, their ammo dump got hit. You know, didn't, uh, ammo blowing up all over the place, flying in the air and everything. Me and Mike and a bunch of guys were, were standing there with our hands on our chest singing the Star Spangled Banner. Uh, I started as an outside man, but most of the year I was uh, assistant gunner, RTO. What, what assistant gunner RTO did, you, uh, you, you received the fire mission from the uh, fire direction center, you took down the mission, you read the mission back, you set the elevation, uh, you pulled open the breech block on the gun, uh, you helped the gun chief ram the round in, a projectile we called it, then you threw the powder in, then you closed the uh, breech, then you told the fire direction center you're ready to fire, and uh, after it fired, I had opened the breech, we had this long stick with a wet rag on the end of it, and uh, we had to clean, I, uh, then I had to clean the breech block out, so. Uh, actually, one thing about, good about Vietnam is I actually, I got ripped over there. <laughs> I mean, I mean, I had muscles. <laughs> nice, year round tan, I had muscles, I mean. You know, right, I mean, because these rounds were weighed about 100 pounds a piece, plus the ammunition, plus the sandbags. I mean, I was only weighed about 125 pounds myself, you know, right, so, you know. I was nice and tan. I had no, no stomach. You can see that that uh, stayed with me. Yeah, sure. Uh, <laughs> I remember I went after one fire mission. I went in the back down the bunker. Everybody was was smoking, naturally. So, hey, can I have a smoke? So sure, that's how I started smoking. So that's why I've been smoking for about fifty years now. So, uh, one time I was uh, out with Mike. We're hanging out near the shower, which was, we had a shower made out of uh, uh, powder canisters. These were long canisters, and you screwed the end off. You pulled out a bag of pot. I knew what it, what it was. I can't believe that I had been, I had three years of college, and this was the 1960s, and I had never smoked pot before, so. But uh, I'll tell you, little Mary Jane helped me get through that year in Vietnam. Certainly did, yeah. yeah. Uh, anyway, we fire, we fire a lot during the day. We fire a lot during the night. We fire a lot for the 25th Infantry Division, which had a company across the airstrip from us. Every day they go without in their armored personnel carriers. We knew we were going, they were going to make contact. They always did. And we ended up having to fire, usually quite a bit. Then when, then, then when they were through, we could always see them coming back generally towing several of their blown up uh, armored personnel carriers. So. Eventually I started on the night crew. Uh, uh, we fired so much sometimes at night especially, it was when we fired the most in right? area, I mean. Uh, I mean, I was the only one in my gun crew that wore glasses. So next day, if I took my glasses off, I looked like a raccoon. Plus, we used to kid about douching our noses out all the time, so. Oh. This was, this was a kind of a, this was, wasn't funny, but it was, wasn't funny at the time, but I think about it was funny. One, one night, we were getting mortars in, and our gun chief, who was uh, Sergeant Schertz, and he was a lifer. He was an idiot, anyway, right? And uh, he came back from the drinking someplace. I don't know where he came back, and 
our commo was out. We had no communication with the fire direction center. So he says, hey, okay, I'll tell you what to do. He says, you guys all line up and you relay the, uh, you re relay the coordinates. One guy relayed to the other guy to the other guy. Yeah, sure. Yeah, we're standing out there. More were coming in. We couldn't have heard the coordinates anyway, so refused to do that. So. This, this sounds, all, all this sounds pretty serious, but we had some fun too, though. Uh, 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 we used to have these rolling parties, the marijuana, you know, right? So we couldn't get rolling papers, so we always got these free cigarettes through these sundry packs in the Red Cross. We always had certain brands that we didn't like, like Lucky Strikes, Pell-Mell, Terryton, because we used to all smoke cools with Salem's anyway, so. So we'd sit there and we'd just unroll the tobacco out, then we'd throw the... the Cigarettes back with pot, so it was pretty cool. Oh. One night, one night, Lance, the surfer from California, uh, we were passing bowls around, and we got him so screwed up that he, it was his first night firing on the on night crew. And he was so messed up, they had to kick him off the night crew because he couldn't do anything, you know, right, basically. <laughs> We also had mail call, which kind of, was, we all look forward to mail call. I remember I was there about a month. I received a package from my grandmother. Okay. Uh, but apparently she got the address wrong. So it had about 12 different addresses stamped on it. It got to me after a month after she sent it. Naturally it was brownies, so you can imagine what shape they were in. So, And uh, the favorite packages were from my father. He would buy these airline bottles of booze and send them over there, right? So when I ever got a package, boy, all the guys got really excited. So. We usually knock that booze off in about an hour or two anyway, so. Uh, plus, we had a radio station over there, which covered the whole country, called AFVN. I know a lot of you probably saw the movie Good Morning Vietnam, and, you know, and that was a radio station, you know, and they, they, that's how they announced when they came on the air in the morning. Good morning, Vietnam, so. And uh, they played mostly top 40. Everybody, everybody in my growing crew had radios. You know, we had several radios because radios were always getting blown up by the gun. We were stepping on them, or somehow they got damaged. So, uh, remember our, some favorite songs over there were uh, "My Sherry Amore," "Boy Named Sue," "Ruby Don't Take Your Love to Town," "Crystal Blue Persuasion," and my least favorite. They played all the time. Continuously, I first got there with the Americas Express by Crosby, Stills, Nash. So, we also had a cassette player. We only had two cassettes. We played all the time. There was Best of Cream and the Beatles' White Album. Uh, uh, photographer Tim Page was an English photographer who wrote several books about Vietnam. He called Vietnam the first rock and roll war. We also sat around nighttime. We enjoyed seeing these gunships firing above us, you know, right? Uh, they were fixed wing ships that fired mini guns. We called this, we called this, these gunships spooky or sometimes puffed magic dragon. Um, uh, nighttime in Vietnam was always the most scariest time. I didn't mind daytime over there, but nighttime was always scary because you never know what was going to happen over there, nighttime. So, well, that's it for today, and uh, next week I'll continue on, I suppose, so, okay, thanks a lot. Bye. All right, Dave Tarleton, thank you. You ready? No, can I go home? You're not in Kansas anymore. Uh, all right, Dorothy. All right, um. This first one's one of my older ones before my teacher started yelling at me about channeling my emotions. It's called A Glimpse Into Me, a past I can't outrun, who I am I can no longer hide from. Always searching, but I'm sure what I'm really chasing. Always a battle, but what am I even facing? At 14, sanctuary, a place to call home. So jail became my place of safety, yet so many judged me ignorantly. At 15, I pursued street dreams. By 17, I ran the team. Yes, I confess, I've done more wrong than right, and I still enjoy a good fight. I was a kid labeled a juvenile delinquent. I hated life and wanted everyone to feel the pains I felt. Well, forgive me. Some of my past is still a secret. 
The darker corners of my mind still at times gets out of hand, constantly scheming. A battlefield of demons, but I battle them myself, myself, and it's safe to say it's an honest war, one to which I don't keep score. At least today I do more good than harm. Maybe I broke a heart or two, and I'm sorry for them girls I scarred. I can never make better the pains I've caused, and if you hear these words today, know them true. It's not on you, love. I was a fool. Like a princess is how I treat my nieces, so she knows any less and truth is loveless. It's really no excuse. Daddy was never there, never taught me to be a man, so I try to keep my sons by the hand to teach them embrace their flaws, that love's not forced but flows, and, now, and I let them make mistakes just to ask what they learned. As hard as it is, I try not to let them be scorned. For so long, I did Satan's bidding. Who am I kidding? I was the devil himself. But please, who I was is not who I am. At 28, I'm finally learning how to be a man. Four sons I call shadows with hopes they hide from my rays. But you know what? Today, I no longer have to hate. A tight grip on my soul or evil will win. I'm an addict, born from addicts out of sin. And I can't blame mommy. As for daddy, it took his death for me to forgive him just not of everything he did. As for what you think of me, I judge myself more harshly. No matter what I'm wearing, I still feel like a wolf in sheep's clothing. Ooh. This one's called Family Trees. Farmers reach through branches of trees to pluck free oranges. I wonder. Before they squeeze this orange for all it's worth, do they consider the life, the life about to be destroyed? Is there even a brief moment of remorse? Do these farmers offer up some twisted prayer, thanking some god of harvest before this sadistic sacrifice that causes the sun to brighten, these oranges to pulse as they hold it out like Hamlet with a skull, squeezing, till the outer tissue tears in its juice spews, oozing through crevices, seeping down their fingers and palms, drinking its life force, staining their lips and chin in a gloss of sin, Consuming this precious nectar, this ambrosia for or from your God, till you have taken your fill, and all that you hold is disembodied flesh, mangled remembrance of what once was, throwing it to the ground, disregarded, already forgotten, while you pluck the meat from beneath your nails, without so much as even a second thought. Wait, do you ever think of it after? Do you rejoice in this feat? Consider what it must feel like for someone you love to sliver through your barriers up under your ribs so you can feel their cold hands grasping your heart, squeezing time and time again, suckling your soul till you're withered away with nothing else to give. Because I am barren. And I don't have any more to give. But I still don't want to believe that this is all family is. Carrie's not here, so I get to use my phone. I had it written down, but I don't have my portfolio with me. It's called One Doesn't Fit All. They say, wear these shoes and walk in the path of the righteous. Wear these shoes and no peace. These same shoes that fit like the blood that flowed all because someone thought another would be more fitting to believe in, I mean, to put their feet in, only to find out the instep feels as if it's bending in on itself. These shoes will help my heal, only to blister my soul. So you feel like you're walking on eggshells, afraid of a misstep like one mistake will be a thousand sharp points confining your choices. Because Cinderella made it clear, not every foot will fit every pair. Yet still you scrunch the toes and wiggle for room, because when it looks good on you, just for me doesn't hold true. So you adjust your tongue to know your place when the truth shoots up your legs causing back pains. I believe I have a right to choose, and your laces are too tight, your ankles too bare. My toes don't angle like yours, so I'm sorry. Your shoes just aren't meant for me. I'm in. Cause if 
nobody see my lady this live alone will drive crazy oh you don't know the shape i'm in i'm gonna go down to the river but i ain't gonna jump in no no i just be looking for He's fairly local, Jonathan Edwards. Thank you. 
hope for more. Fill it, light it, shut up and close the door. We're going to lay around the shanty mama and put a good buzz on. one by Steeler's Wheel. self-made man and your family all can call slap you on the back and say please everybody thanks for coming out drive safe going home and it's good to see you all again